as many of you know, during May, Preservation Month, National Preservation Month, Society co-sponsors the Big Now Lecture with the Gross Point community's greatest example of historic preservation, the Edsel and Eleanor Ford House. We're all very fortunate that when Eleanor Clay Ford passed away in 1976, as the Detroit Free Press noted at the time, quote, Mrs. Ford's greatest gift to the public, indeed her greatest legacy, is her home, which she had transferred to a trust with the request that it be used to benefit the public, unquote. With this final act of generosity, which was outlined in her will as a result of many things, but one of them being the fact that the Rose Terrace Mansion had just come down earlier that year, uh, all of the, the home and the furnishings remained as a window to the past, Rose Point's past. Let me now introduce Mark Hefner, president of the Edson Eleanor Ford House, so he can welcome us further. And let me mention, if you haven't seen Gross Point magazine, on the cover is Ford House, Preservation, Restoration, and Eyes on Design, the Father's, uh, um, Father um, Day weekend show here, uh, car show. So, Mark Hefner. Thank you very much. So, I want to thank Mike, number one. Uh, I know pretty much all of you know Mike. I've never met anybody who's more passionate about our history, preserving it, sharing it. And I get actually just, we were at dinner this evening, and I'm sitting there listening, and Brian and Mike talking, and in some ways I'm like, oh my gosh, there's such history nerds there. No. <laughs> We're going on and on and on. But that passion is so critical for everything that we do, whether it's the Gross Point Historical Society, preserving our local history, and sharing that and making it accessible for future generations, or the Phuket Avenue plan, or here at Ford House. This is important. This is our heritage. This is our story. So I want to welcome you on behalf of the Board of Trustees of here at Ford House and the staff. How many of you have been to the new Ford House, with these new buildings? So not as many. So let me ask you this question. Do you like what we've done here? Yes. yes. So what I love too, and I have to tell you, I've done um, just yesterday, matter of fact, during past the new Historical Society. And what I gotta tell you, for those that know Ford House and what we've done here, these buildings are physically transformational, just what you're doing at the Historical Society. But what's more important is gonna be the cultural transformation that occurs. It is an opportunity to really to pause for the community, let the uh, community know how important what you all do is important. So if you're a member of the Historical Society, which I assume most of you are, thank you. If you're not, do support the Gross Point Historical Society and all our heritage uh, sites here in Southeast Michigan. So um, I just wanted to say again, welcome. We're honored to be a partner with the Historical Society. We're honored every year to bring you this. I missed it last year. Some of you probably are here. Um, it was a weird year, I know, with COVID and everything, and I was out of town. Um, and it's so nice just to see faces here. And I'm thrilled to have met Brian this evening. His, again, passion, his story, is fascinating, his interest in this world of what he's going to share with you tonight. Um, I'm just, you know, astounded because, again, I get tidbits of history and what I do in my work. I don't get the pleasure of just being so immersed into what you all do. So, again, Brian, thank you for being here. Michael, thank you for making it happen. And my gratitude to the Historical Society for everything you do. By the way, you mentioned the Paquette plan, and I can't make this too much of an advertisement, but Jill, please stand up. This is Jill from Gross Point Park. She's the president of the uh, Fort Paquette Avenue plan, and uh, there are rack cards in the back, our brand new rack cards from Paquette. So, oh, how do you know that, too, by the way? We do have uh, four house information. So yes. <laughs> My staff will kill me if I don't say that. And uh, on the board at Paquette uh, is a gentleman from Gross Point City. Uh, Adrian Price, who was in charge of making the ventilators, uh, and he also made the Ford mask. So there are Ford Motor Company logo uh, masks back there, if anybody is as big a crazy collector as I am. Um, so enough of that. But let me uh, go, go to tonight's program. There I am. Uh, the PowerPoint presentation is loosely tied uh, to this evening's presenter's upcoming Wayne State University Press book, Mega Builder, Henry Ford, and His Circle of Architects. This book will tell the story of the impact that Mr. Ford had, uh, along with his son, Ethel, to, to a large extent, on architecture, engineering, and building technology, and the many architects, engineering, and, um, and uh, landscape architects, industrial interior designers who work with the Fords. This evening's program will survey the four, four homes that Ethel and Ford built in Michigan and Maine, uh, which were designed by three different architects, 
and uh, the relationships that Mr. and Mrs. Ford had with numerous designers and artists who were involved in the construction and design of these homes. The evening's presenter is Brian McMahon. Brian is a trained architect with degrees from the University of Notre Dame uh, and Pratt Institute School of Architecture. His first book, uh, the, uh, I have one extra copy, if there's anybody <laughs> first come to serve, and then Mark has one for Ford House, uh, is uh, The Ford Century in Minnesota. It was published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2016. It tells the story of Ford Motor Company's production in Minneapolis and St. Paul, uh, Minnesota from the Mount era through the closure of the Twin Cities assembly plant uh, when they stopped building the old Ranger pickup truck in 2011. This book was a finalist for the Minnesota Book Award and received Best Book Award from the Minnesota Chapter Society of Architectural Historians. Brian also authored more than, has also authored more than 40 articles, professional papers, and a theatrical script and organized a number of exhibits and lecture programs from, um, on urban history and development. He has received research grant awards from the Minnesota Historical Society, the Minnesota Labor Interpretive Center, the Ramsey County Historical Society, and the Minnesota Sesquicentennial Commission. Prior to taking up writing full time, Brian had a design build business in his native New York City restoring landmark buildings. He lives in Stillwater, Minnesota, near Minneapolis, St. Paul. This historic town is on the St. Croix River, across from Holton, Wisconsin, and his, he and his wife, Teresa, uh, have raised four children there. I must say that I am very jealous of Brian that Martha Stewart let him go into Skylands, the Ford's home, in Seal Harbor, Maine, on Mount Desert Island this past December. When I visited Seal Harbor, I never got past the gatehouse. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they certainly were not inviting me in, but um, uh, uh, spectacular uh, having uh, Brian as a uh, house guest, and I uh, want to welcome Brian McMahon. here. Thank you, Mike, for the kind introduction and your warm welcome to the Michigan Fan Club for Albert Kahn and the Ford Motor Company. I am honored to be uh, presented, uh, presenting tonight here at the beautiful Edsel and Eleanor Ford House, a true model for historic preservation and how it can be done. So over the last several years, I've been in communication with a number of people who are probably in this audience uh, uh, on these related topics, so I am uh, hoping that tonight's program will be more of an opportunity to extend this continuing uh, education that we have going on in this mutual education. So I have been interested in architecture seemingly since birth. My interest in Ford, however, came later. Although I understand that some of this audience were probably born with that from the, from the way it's, uh, I'm learning and talking to some of these people. With me, it was an acquired taste that developed over time. The Fords, including their extended family, uh, employees, close associates, and friends, uh, may arguably have been the most important, the most significant clients or patrons in the history of American architecture. They constructed thousands of buildings, projects all around the country and the world, every building type, including industrial, commercial, institutional, and residential, their activity uh, took place uh, uh, as the traditional methods of construction were being reshaped by the new materials and technologies, some of which they themselves pioneered. My upcoming book seeks to uh, connect these two seemingly different things. We're talking architecture and we're talking Ford. What I'm really trying to do is connect them in a way, and I believe that by linking them, it makes each of them all the richer. Architecture is a collaborative effort involving the clients, the architect, and on larger, more complex projects, the team could include engineers, landscape architects, industrial designers, interior decorators, and, and married specialty engineers. Others could also play a contributing role, including architectural educators, professional associations like the AIA, the design media, including books, journals, and general interest magazines, and contractors who take an increasingly important role in the era of more complex projects. And in some cases, we also have another layer of interest, and that is local architects uh, of record. When national architects and national companies 
are building all around the country, they will often need to have a local architect who will help guide them through that process. The, so, there's, in my view, a need to view buildings in a broader context, given all the people that are involved in helping create the building, and to understand that it's not just the finished object that we're looking at in an aesthetic way, but it's really understanding what went into making the buildings. And this, this, this lesson was really brought home to me some uh, 25, 30 years ago when I visited a plant called the Twin Cities Assembly Plant in, in St. Paul, designed by Albert Kahn, and I'm, I haven't checked this yet to see if it's working, let's go. Yeah. So that's the uh, plant. It was uh, described at the time as the most beautiful assembly plant in the world, the most beautiful industrial building in the world, designed by Albert Kahn, very similar to the Ford Engineering uh, Laboratory here in Dearborn. But, and Albert Kahn had finished the design put it out to bid, and they were literally about to break ground. Ford, Henry Ford rarely got out to see his buildings before, during, or after construction, but he happened to come by the Twin Cities en route to some other location and said, well, let's go see the new site in, in the Twin Cities. And uh, so he walked the grounds, looked, looked it over, and that's, that's the finished building. There's the site, and you can see that it's undeveloped, and the view here is from the Mississippi side of the, uh, uh, the Minneapolis side of the Mississippi River. And uh, Henry Ford decided on the spot to change the orientation of this building 90 degrees. I mean, they're about to break ground. And he says, I want you to turn the 1,200-foot-long uh, classical facade to face the river, so people on the river can see the, the beautiful building, and the people in Minneapolis. Okay, so, so the architect, who often said, it's the client's money and they can do what they want, <laughs> went back to the drawing boards to reconfigure rail and road connect, uh, connections and to account for all the related uh, impacts on lighting and ventilation. One of the major ones was that the 1,200 foot long facade is now facing west and they will be getting the, the setting sun. Picture all those windows in the days before air conditioning with all the hot equipment in there. It was over 100 degrees on not a few occasions turning that plant and that did not sit well with the workforce as we can, we can imagine. So lots can go wrong in the process of making a building. And in the case of the uh, Twin Cities assembly plant, there clearly appeared to be some miscommunication between client and architect. Not unusual. And now, in fairness to Ford and Kahn, the Twin Cities assembly plant was part of the second phase of Ford's branch assembly plants, which located buildings on large, undeveloped rural parcels, which was very different from the first phase on small urban lots. Ford had earlier constructed a 10-story building in Minneapolis and a three-story building in St. Paul. got a deep parity between the two cities, which were bitter rivals. The one in Minneapolis was on about an acre. It was the tallest building ever constructed for the purpose of uh, making cars. But a decade, later, uh, a decade later, as they're shifting manufacturing now from being a vertical process to horizontal, architects had to quickly adapt. So we're going from a one-acre site to a thousand acre site. And things have to become more collaborative. Things have to become more interconnected with all the other forces that involve the construction of the making of the design of the building. And in, in making that clear, obviously the outcome of the, the understanding these all these external influ influences will bring about a much better uh, outcome and a better building. Incidentally, A similar dynamic was taking place with residential architecture as wealthy clients like the Fords were withdrawing from urban sites to build at large, undeveloped sites. They were motivated in part by the loss of privacy in the city and security concerns as they became the target uh, for all sorts of unwelcome visitors. Edsel and Eleanor moved from their home on Jefferson Avenue 
because of concerns about in increased developments in the neighborhood. And they ended up going from a two-acre site to, I think it's 125 acre sites here in Golden Point. So we're talking about a whole new type of architecture, a whole new type of uh, design considerations. And uh, with the larger site, they have opportunities to build outbuildings, all kinds of other uh, activities that they can uh, contemplate doing on the site. So this type of transition from a design standpoint clearly raises more issues that are appropriate to things like urban planning because we're now talking about roads, uh, all kinds of other critical infrastructure, utilities and the like. Now, this is something else that is happening here, and it just, it's, it's really quite interesting to see how this comes about. You get a large site, and all of a sudden, you're not in an urban area, all of a sudden, a new consideration comes in, and that's views. Whether you're looking at, uh, you know, the ocean and, and the place in Maine, or uh, the beautiful hilltop in Haven Hill, you got to factor in the designing opportunities for taking advantage of the, what they call the landscape architecture circles, the view shed. So views and the view shed. Eleanor and Essel deliberately sought out large parcels with great views, including Skylands in Maine and Gawker Point, of course, and, and, and Haven Hill. As seen from the names they give on their homes, hilltops were preferred. But again, this is something that becomes more important as the scale of the the site becomes larger. So the increasing emphasis on location and view gave rise to a new type of uh, uh, professional expertise, real estate agents who could understand the programmatic and psychological needs of the clients, and most importantly, were able to maintain complete discretion. There was an important business reason also for confidentiality, because as a practical matter, many large sites had to be assembled, usually requiring several proxy buyers quietly arranging for purchase contracts without revealing the identity of, buyer, uh, of the buyer. You know, there's no point in, in, in assembling 850 acres if the one in the middle is not going to be available, the whole project is not going to work. So at this location, Ford had to assemble 200 parcels, 200 separate buyer, uh, owners, before he would even consider closing on the site. And by the way, he didn't do it. He made the people in the city do it. So that was kind of an interesting exercise on his part. With this complete discretion, real estate agents earned the trust of their clients and often were asked to assist them in a variety of local matters, including the selection of architects. Duncan Candler, the architect Eleanor selected for, uh, El uh, Eleanor selected for, uh, at the, at the, at the uh, Eleanor Essel House in the, in the vacation home in Maine, was recommended by George Stebbins, who happened to be the brother-in-law of the architect that they ultimately used. So if you're the client in Michigan and you're buying property in Maine, you really do need to start lo linking up with people who you have some confidence in. So uh, Candler was a New York architect who became the most prominent uh, architect at the resort community of uh, Mount Desert, Maine, and, and another client of uh, Stevens was John D. Rockefeller. Oh, you know, let me uh, back up, uh, past this one. This is when uh, Henry and his entourage were visiting St. Paul, and uh, it was at this time that they decided to flip the, uh, the orientation. That's Essel, of course, with them there. And James with Okay, so what I'm going to talk about now, or coming up here, is uh, the way architects, and Ford in particular, were looking at things and some of their uh, intriguing personal characteristics and traits. Uh, but I did want to go to, did I get, sorry, did I get, no, let me go back. I guess I didn't get the, uh, the Rockefeller House. So when he was at uh, the house in Maine, Seal Harbor, the next door neighbor of Edsel and Eleanor 
was John D. Rockefeller and Abby Rockefeller. And this was the beginning of quite a, 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 a fulsome kind of friendship between the two. And uh, one of the things, of course, that they had in common is that they were both wealthy. I'm talking very wealthy. Very wealthy. Well, John D. Rockefeller, Sr., and Henry Ford, in various histories, were credited with being America's first billionaires. So it kind of goes back and forth depending upon how you, how you calculate it. And the first year that uh, taxes were made public, and we did that in this country for a few years, can you imagine the ruckus that that created? Uh, in 1924, John D. Rockefeller Jr. ended up paying the highest income tax in the country at 62 million, which in today's dollars would be 100 and $5 million. Uh, Edsel paid the third highest at $2 million, and uh, Henry actually paid the second that year uh, the equivalent of $43 million. So we're talking tax bills a lot heavy, and what it certainly reflects all of their, uh, their wealth. Now the most important influences on Edsel, one of the most important influences on Edsel, was his father, Henry, of course. And I believe they shared several important traits. They were collectors, they were makers of all kinds of things, and builders. And understanding these interests can provide a better understanding of the forces and motivations which shaped their architecture. Henry collected all manner of antique objects which he believed were a better uh, way to convey history than conventional books. In a 1923 interview, Ford explained, I deeply admire the men who founded this country, and I think we ought to know more about how they lived. Of course, we can read about them, but it cannot call up the full picture. The only way to see how our forefathers lived and to bring to mind what kind of people they were is to reconstruct as nearly as possible the exact conditions under which they lived. Israel Sack, the antiques dealer, who provided some of the furnishings at the Wayside Inn, and several buildings at Greenfield Village explained Ford's thinking. It was just as plain as day to me. He wanted the early American with the history. You see, he didn't have to study history. He came right into it. You get a Longfellow connection, and you look at the bed, you look at the desk where Longfellow slept and worked. You got Longfellow in the home already. He wanted something with the background. And this rationale is certainly consistent with Ford's general skepticism about book learning and belief in his hands-on learning experience, which applied even to the subject of history. Michael Cannon observed, for his problem was really quite simple. He needed to establish a means of relating to the past for himself and for others that did not depend upon books. Ford was not a reader, but objects uh, fascinated him. By the early 1920s, Henry went on a buying spree collecting old objects tools for the most part, and eventually old buildings, a lot of which ended up in Greenfield Village. He made uh, several trips to the Bucks County region in Pennsylvania to examine a private tool collection assembled by the proprietor of a, a historic hotel. The local newspaper in September 1923 captured Henry Ford's state of mind, quote, he showed an almost boyish interest in the description of antiques and the stories of the uses and associations of many of these articles. Uh, I must have said, oh, he would see things and say, I must have it. I must have that. It's like a kid in a candy shop. Send it to me. I must have that. Once when somebody said uh, the price was too high, he said, I didn't ask the price. Just send it to me. <laughs> and see that it is well packed. Ford made a lump sum, and he also, also said, and make sure it's authentic. He didn't want a copy or a replica of one of these, of these old tools. He wanted the real deal. It had to come with the authenticity. For one collection, he made an offer sum, lump sum, 75000 for the old kit and boodle, which undoubtedly was very generous, but the uh, owner declined. Uh, persistent Ford returned two years later and acquired the whole lot. Now, on that trip, Ford also uh, made a uh, visit to the Mercer Museum in Pennsylvania. Anybody ever heard of it? Yeah. 
And that, that was founded by Henry Chapman Mercer, who had amassed an impressive collection of tools from pre-industrial America, which is the same area of interest as Ford. So Mercer displayed these tools starting in 1897. Henry Ford said, this is the only museum I've ever been sufficiently interested in to visit. And he said, someday I expect to have a museum which will rival it. The museum still has the signature of Henry Ford and his visitor logs. Greenfield Village would not officially open until 1933, some 36 years after uh, the opening of the Mercer Museum. Ford was not much of a book reader, as we know, but he did, quote, read historical artifacts and, and engines, and his great engine collection in the Ford Museum was his library. His longtime aide, W.J. Cameron, wrote, they were living things to him, those machines. He could almost diagnose the arrangement by touching it. There was a peculiar sympathy between him and a machine. Ford's peculiar sympathy towards his tool and machine artifacts and the manner in which he went about collecting them, especially the buildings placed in Greenfield, uh, suggests that he viewed these objects as association objects, or relics, or talisman, okay? In, the, in, a, in a, their paper entitled, Numinous Objects, Rachel Maines and James Glynn explain, the significance of these artifacts is psychological rather than material. It is if they are to borrow uh, Term from Roman paganism, inhabited, inhabited by a human or spirit that calls forth in many of us a reaction of awe and reverence. These are the objects we can collect and preserve, not for what they may reveal to us as material documents or for any visible aesthetic quality, but for their association, real or imagined, with some person, place, or event endowed with some special social, uh, social culture magic. The, numin the numinosity of an artifact or a place, the intangible and invisible quality of its significance, consists in its presumed association with something either in the past, or in the imagination, or both, that carries an emotional weight with the viewer. Now, one example the authors of that paper cited was uh, Henry Ford and, and the Thomas Edison, the relocation of the Thomas Edison uh, workshop in from, from New Jersey. And they say that Ford so revered the Newman of his fellow inventor Thomas Edison that when the latter's workshop was moved from New Jersey to Michigan for Ford's new museum, Ford had the very soil under the original building shipped to Dearborn, lest any of the uh, historical magic of the place be lost. In addition to the workshop and the door and the dirt, Ford he may have known this, uh, actually captured Thomas Edison's last breath while he was on his deathbed, which he preserved in a glass fla a flask in his museum. A lot of strange things he collected. Another, <laughs> another thing he tried to acquire was the body of Abraham Lincoln's assassin, John Wilkes Booth. Ford was a big admirer of Lincoln and had already owned and displayed the chair in which Lincoln was sitting in when assassinated and, of course, a courthouse in Illinois in which Lincoln appeared while practicing law. But the body, as it turns out, of John Wilkes Booth was a complete hoax, and uh, Ford ended up walking away, but not before spending considerable sums trying to authenticate the story of some crazy guy who said he had the body. And a book, an interesting book has been written about that near, near, near Swindle. Uh, but we see a lot of things in Greenfield Village that kind of underscore this point. When he uh, recreated the garage where he built his first automobile, he went to great efforts to find the original structure and salvage the bricks. As it turned out, the workmen mistakenly took bricks from an adjacent building. It's not clear if this affected the site value, but it, and there may be other variations in that story, which uh, Mike Skinner is kind of introducing to me, and I'll learn more about that. With the Susquehanna House, he even relocated the carved tombstone and last remains, last remains of the two Rousby brothers who had been buried in a garden a hundred yards from the house. Okay, for the Cotswold Cottage that's at Greenfield Village, he actually moved the sheep that were in the garden. This is in England the live sheep, and he brought those over to Greenfield Village. 
A Ford Company publication attributed this unusual behavior to Henry Ford's meticulous attention to detail and his great feelings for the integrity of Greenfield Village. Uh, Ford had the same sense of reverence toward, towards the objects he displayed within his museum, explaining, whatever is produced today has something in it of everything that has gone on before. Even a present-day chair embodies all previous chairs. His policy of recycling industrial materials may have in some convoluted way reflected his view of reincarnation and luminosity. Ford could even find special meaning in a dead cat, which was discovered during the restoration of the Bots Botsford uh, Tavern in New England. It had apparently been trapped in a partition where it died. Ford insisted that the cat be brought to Greenfield Village and be displayed, or to his museum and be displayed in a, in a, in a case there. So for virtually most of the buildings that he constructed for his own personal use, his homes, other uh, meaningful houses, he would move objects from one location and include them in his new, new property. At Fairlane, for example, he moved rocks from the farm of uh, John Burroughs' house and, uh, in upstate New York, which he used to construct a grotto. It should also be noted that Essel, in the case of the Coca Point home, had taken up the practice of installing architectural artifacts were uh, taken from other buildings, old historic buildings in England. Um, it, it is unclear if Essel had inherited his father's belief in numinous objects, but one can assume there was something more at work here than just aesthetic interest. It would have been far easier to just measure the originals and make the copies. And this would have also uh, saved a lot of time on the construction, because as we know, uh, Gawker Point House took three years, one year for the house, and basically two years to install all of the uh, panels and the other uh, artifacts that he regarded. Uh, and the last thing I'll say, I think about uh, Ford about it and, and uh, moving things, after Edsel died, uh, grieving Henry Ford went back to their former home on Edison Avenue and removed portions of the house and installed them in a recreated structure at Greenfield as a memorial. Perhaps it served as a memento of what was likely the happiest times that he ever had with his son. But again, there's a lot of things that motivated Ford. Marcel Proust in his book, The Memory of Things Past, wrote, I feel there's much to be said for the Celtic belief that the souls of those with whom we have held, the souls of those whom we, we have lost are held captive in some inferior being, in an animal, in a plant, in some inanimate object, and so effectively lost to us today. When, but when we happen to pass by the tree to obtain possession of the object, uh, which forms the, but when we go by the, the tree or the object, uh, it, and this automatically releases the spirit of the memory, and the tree trembles, calls by our name, and as soon as they have recognized their voice, the spell is broken, we have delivered them, they have overcome death, and returned to share our life. So here's this very interesting mystical belief that proves to saying it's a Celtic Irish tradition. Now perhaps Ford's Irish roots may offer some uh, interesting insight, insights into this, and I think it's kind of important because it is a very important part of the way Etzel and Henry built. Uh, and you probably know the story of William and Henry's father uh, came from a family of generations of indentured servants. And this is actually the indenture certificate signed by like William's great grandmother or something like that, and working uh, on a farm that they had leased as, as uh, indentured servants. Ford was also very close with Patrick Ahern, who was his adoptive uh, grandfather on his mother's side, who was also from Ireland, and who lived with the Fords. The Irish, particularly those from rural areas, were known for their belief with, uh, with the supernatural world, and this shaped their landscape and their buildings. Things were controlled and directed by some hidden undertow. Celtic psyche and culture maintained that every tree, mountain, rock, and spring possessed its own spirit or movement. 
So Ford's ancestors lived in primitive stone huts. That is reputed to be um, the family stone hut in Ireland that William emigrated from. He was raised there with uh, six children, and that's a tight squeeze in a pretty simple stone hut with a dirt floor and all of the above. So Ford's, uh, and these huts were designed around a worldview which was steeped in tradition and mystical beliefs. The hut was seen as an interface between the human and the supernatural worlds and its portals, storage windows and chimneys, were limited zones or points of contact between these worlds and, and the hut. Firstly, every activity, including the siting of the house, the construction techniques, and the routine activities within the house were regulated by, le by beliefs that their lives were shaped by spirit beings and fairies. Every entry door typically faced east, representing the, the life of the rising sun. It was considered bad luck to add extensions to a house in the westerly direction towards the setting sun. In traditional Irish wakes, the corpse was always typically placed on the western part of the, the building uh, for that purpose. During construction, builders would uh, also plant or do a practice called foundation sacrifice. They would bury symbolic objects it, under the foundation, including the, things like a horse skull, which would bring something, to, a guardian spirit to protect against all the bad things. There were landscape and ritual, certain plants and trees were good, and certain things were not. To keep away the bad spirits, they would bring good luck. Henry Ford had a strong affinity to his Irish roots. Uh, in 1912, Henry and Clara visited the family farm with Etzel, and they tried to buy the hut, which was in complete rundown, dilapidated shape. They actually literally had to, he got all the old brush to find it. Uh, but the local owner, on the advice of his parish priest, asked for way too much money, and Henry could definitely write some pretty heavy checks when he was interested. But as a consolation, he acquired its hearthstone, which had enormous symbolic value to the Irish, and this was later installed in the uh, Fireplace in in in, uh, in Fairlane, his dear one residence. Like his father, Ezra was a collector, but his interest was mainly in art and antiques. But he did collect the architectural uh, artifacts, as mentioned. And uh, Ezra had evidenced a lifelong interest in art, encouraged by his supportive mother, who saved his early pictures. And these are luminous objects, as parents we all know, of the most cherished and personal sort. Ezra also took his art seriously and took painting lessons from the acclaimed. Uh, Detroit artist John Carroll. He would occasionally take lessons from Irving Bacon, the uh, Ford Company artist. And uh, at one point, actually, Henry Ford was given art lessons by Irving Bacon, which was really quite a, out of character, you would think. This is the house that has been basically re kind of restored now in Ireland. And six generations of the Ford family, including the present CEO of the Old Law, have now visited this site. Six generations of the Ford families have tied back their interest into this site. With this uh, privileged upbringing, Edsel could readily gain entree to the world of art and culture. In 1913, the year after Edsel's and uh, Henry's trip to Ireland, the family traveled to upstate New York to visit the arts and crafts community founded by Elbert Hubbard in, uh, in upstate New York, known as Roy Craft. Hubbard was a follower of the arts and crafts uh, movement in England. And his goal, Hubbard's goal, was to create a self-sustaining village which was to produce high-quality, handcrafted furniture, books, lamps, and metal works that were reflective of the movement's ideals of art and craftsmanship as an instrument of social reform. At its peak, over 800 artisans were gathered at this little village, attracted by Hubbard's philosophy, if not his flamboyant, Persona. He was quite a striking and popular figure and uh, on, the, on the lecture circuit. This is him on the far left, and you can see this is 1913. Edsel, uh, uh, Henry, Eleanor, Edsel, and Clara. So, not too many.
many people have heard about this. this I came about this by an odd uh, thing, but this is, uh, he was, this is Eli, Albert L. Hum, Hum, uh, Hubbard on the left there. And uh, so his writings came to the attention of Henry Ford, which is why, why he wanted to go visit this place. So Hubbard, show you how flamboyant he was, never the entrepreneur, he advertised for stones for his building construction, paying one dollar a wagon load to farmers who eagerly bought the unwanted stones from their farmlands. He then put his craftsmen to work, constructing what would become a 14-building campus. He bought up and moved local houses to add to the site. His belief in education by learning by doing certainly appealed to Ford. He, he uh, offered free room and board for boys and men who would work for the public good on his property, at least two, two hours a day, uh, and his workshops and received an education in return. Uh, this introduction to the philosophy of arts and crafts was really something that was very important to Henry Ford, who would later go on to visit uh, California and discover the, the bungalows out there, the crafting buildings, and he ended up building, oh, I'd say two or three or four for his related family and, and uh, employees and what. El Elbert, uh, another thing in common with Ford, Hubbard announced his intentions in 1915 to end World War I by meeting with the Kaiser and other combatants. This was seven months before Henry Ford's quixotic bishop uh, adventure. So Hubbard sailed for Europe with his wife, Alice, on the SS Lusitania, as sadly were among those who perished when the, when the ship was sunk by a German submarine in May uh, 1915. So Henry's his ship was November of that year. You've got to think of some interesting connection here, but who knows. Now, uh, Etzel's uh, first-hand engagement, here's a picture of Etzel also at the same site. Actually, at the Hubbard Museum, um, they, they, they say that the person sitting in the middle of the bench there is actually uh, Henry Ford, but as we all know, looking at it, that's clearly Etzel Ford. So I had it corrected in that, and they were happy to see that. And uh, uh, I mentioned that Henry and uh, Hubbard became quite friendly uh, on their shared interest in lots of different things. And he was at one point placed on the cover of one of the journals that uh, Hubbard published. So, and uh, Essel's engagement with the Roy Craft, the arts and crafts, is clearly shown in, um, in his renovations to his house on Uruguay. We'll see, we'll see a lot of those, and we're going to see a lot of pictures of the buildings coming up. So that would be the one we turn over to see the architecture. Etzel's art collecting became substantially more serious and important as a result of working with Duncan Candler, who was the architect of Skylands out of Maine, who designed summer home next to the Rockefellers. Candler was active in modern art circles in New York and an important collector of modern art. Purchased through a gallery operated by Edith Halpert, who was a Russian emigre who opened one of the first modern art galleries in New York. Candler would occasionally operate as a confidential uh, proxy buyer for his clients, among them, Abby Rockefeller. Eventually, Candler introduced Abby to Halpert, and that's Edith in her gallery. And Abby went on to amass one of the most important modern art collections in the country. Candler was retained by Abby uh, Rockefeller to design a private gallery in an eight-story townhome in New York. And this collection, as you may know, eventually became the basis for Museum of Modern Art in New York, on land that was donated by the Rockefellers. Uh, over time, Halpert served to show folk art. One of the first galleries in the city to do so, Abby became an important collector, along with her husband John, who had much more traditional tastes and did not like modern art. Uh, he underwrote uh, restorations at places like Versailles, and of course, Colonial Williamsburg, which was pretty much done at the same time as Greenfield Village. And there was considerable interaction between Ford and Rockefeller on their two different restoration projects. And incidentally, the visionaries behind Williamsburg had actually wanted to encourage Ford to get involved in that, and he declined. So that's when they went to Rockefeller. Uh, but uh, Halbert's gallery became an important source of folk art for both Williamsburg and Greenfield. And she made at least one trip to, to uh, Dearborn, where she met and charmed both 
uh, Henry and Etzel. She was very charming. And uh, that's what became an important buyer at the Halbert Gallery, purchasing both uh, modern and folk art. Among the artists represented by uh, Edith was Charles Sheeler. And that's a, what, one of his very, very important uh, paintings. This is one of his photographs. And as you may know, uh, Edsel primarily uh, was responsible for bringing Charles Sheeler out to uh, the Rouge Ranch, uh, the Rouge uh, plants, to uh, do do an artistic thing, and left it left it very very broad as to what he would do. And what he did was both photographs and paintings, and, and these are among the most important items in, in American art today. So, in addition uh, to collecting art and antiques, as he also started to collect architectural artifacts like his father with the expression intent to install them in his new house at uh, Gorkham. With their numerous art connections, uh, they became very active in art circles in both New York and Detroit, as they served on the board of MoMA, as did Eleanor after that's his passing, and both were active in the Detroit Institute of the Arts. It's uh, the DIA's director, the prominent director, William Valentiner, uh, ended up in Detroit, largely at the recommendation uh, a Abby Rockefeller. And of course we know Etzel um, was very prominent in commissioning Diego Rivera to, to paint that stunning mural there. So the, Etzel is kind of working his introduction from a variety of different sources. So the, uh, the, the forest, Etzel and Eller own five homes. The first two, on Iroquois and Jefferson, were existing homes in which they purchased and renovated. There are major economic and scheduling benefits to finding a house that would meet your needs and just move in. And certainly, if you're new, newly married, it's a good reason to hold off on the highly difficult task of, of building a home. It also makes sense, before you're going to build a home, live in a home together as a family and learn things about how you want to build a house, how you would customize it. And uh, customize it around your your preferences and what you're discovering. Now, Eleanor, for instance, felt it was very important to experience the morning sun and the setting sun dictating the layout of a house. Obviously, it has to be oriented if that's what the client wants, a certain way to get the morning sun and the evening sun in the same space. So for two clients immersed in the arts, building a new home uh, also uh, uh, enable them to be completely involved in the creative process. So they decided we're going we're to buy two houses and we're going to build three. So they were ready. They were very, very intelligent and um, creative and their creativity. You know, and also part of this is there is a certain edification to living in a place that you built. I mean, there's something very special and it's different than buying a house even if you what house is functional. The edifice complex is a term that is used, but primarily more for commercial uh, builders and one. For the three homes that, that uh, the, the Fords built, Skylands, Gorkler, and Haven, they worked with three different architects, three quite different sites, ending up with three quite different artistic solutions. Essel and Eleanor were never so doctrinaire rega regarding style as to overpower the essential elements of good architecture. So the question may arise, why did the Fords or any client choose to work with three different architects rather than stay with someone they had a, with whom they had a working relationship? First of all, it's possible that, that their preferred architect was not available at a given time. Some architects were basically one-man shops and would decline projects um, if busy rather than to expand. Those include Lennon Wilkie, who did the work for uh, Iroquois Avenue, and Duncan Candler, who did the work on the Skyline. So those two were solo architects. They didn't want staff, they didn't have staff. Of course, this was not an issue with Alvin Kahn, who had a large office of excellent designers. Now, my guess is that Essel and Eleanor chose different architects because they enjoyed the experience of learning from and interacting with different designers. And as, as a result of their world-class education, they really became quite proficient at designing and building a house, which is no small task in the steep learning curve. With this experience, they would apply 
lessons learned from one project to the other. And this was a practice that was perfected by Henry Ford, who was building scores of uh, industrial buildings, and every one brought lessons that he applied to the next. Uh, before we start looking at the slides of the homes, the final general thought about the relationship of client and architect. The Rockefeller senior and junior. Oh, there's one of Charles Schiele's famous paintings of the Rouge. I mean, these are all like among the, the handful of really important art pieces. So the Rockefellers, there's so many interesting overlaps between the, the Fords and the and, and, and Essel and Ford family in particular. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the relationship between client and architect. The, the Rockefellers were built a lot. Uh, discovered working on the various projects that they had different approaches, different ways to deal with architects. As described by Robert Dalzell, Rockefeller Sr. believed you hired an architect to give you what you wanted to worry about the nuts and bolts of the job. The idea that the primary func their primary function was to set, uh, exercise some independent artistic creativity would have struck them as dangerous in the extreme. If architects were allowed to design whatever they liked, where would it end? And more importantly, who would be in charge? Rockefeller Jr., on the other hand, was more receptive to outside advice. One of his architects, William Wells Bosworth, who it was said did not lack self-confidence, sent a letter to Rockefeller stating, should any question arise between us, or in my opinion, an artistic error would be committed, you will you will not insist on going contrary to my judgment. So that's the opposite extreme. Here's the architect telling me. 8.30 grand, half an hour. Okay, okay, thank you. Half an hour what, in? Okay. No, it's 8.30 8 8 8 p.m. you have a half hour. I have a half an hour. Yes. Thank you. No yeah, more. We're going to get this up on slides. Uh, he asked me to tell me. Yeah, oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so it appears that Edsel and Eleanor were fortunate to have a light mind on uh, all important design decisions. That's not easy. That's not easy. Uh, as a contractor, I've worked with couples, married couples, who couldn't agree on anything. That's, that's, that's the worst nightmare. Uh, but fortunately, they agreed on everything, and they were uh, able to establish a collegial and mutually respectful relationship with the architects. OK, now we're ready to start looking at some houses. How's that? Okay, so this is uh, the house on uh, Iroquois. Leonard Willicke was quite a remarkable architect. Uh, little known, I never heard of him. This is uh, 2171 uh, Illinois. It's still there. Iroquois, sorry. Uh, it was substantially renovated to the designs. It was an existing building, as I said. This is one of the first two that they lived in. And the late Thomas Brunk, who wrote an excellent book on Leonard Wilkie, writes, Leonard Wilkie uh, created a, a remarkable body of work. Not only was he adept at uh, handling all types of commissions, residences, interior decoration, factories, hotels, large-scale urban plans, and even an automobile. He designed an automobile. Um, he personally oversaw every phase of the job. He executed the designs, the working drawings, and wrote the specifications as well as supervising construction and doing the accounting. Well, it's hard to imagine that this, this guy could do about 200 projects, every phase of it by himself. I mean, is that even conceivable? He did not maintain his staff, believing instead that as an architect, he, could retol, or he should retain control over both the design and its execution. And he would only do the jobs that he felt he could have full, full time and commitment to it. Uh, so the Fords were admired. We'll look, I'll just mention this a lot more. I can describe it. Uh, Tom Brooks' book I certainly highly recommend. Um, Wilkie was a uh, was an architect uh, who was trained to some extent at Columbia University as a special student, and then went to the Ecole de Beaux Arts in Paris. Incidentally, with this is the same room exactly as Duncan Candler, who we're going to see later. Columbia Ecole de Beaux Arts, which was uh, certainly the greatest architecture school in the world. 
the time in Columbia was also highly regarded. So these were two highly trained, professionally, academically trained. Khan is just the opposite. No, no academic training whatsoever. But it's interesting to see the comparison how people got into the field. So the Fords admired the uh, arts and uh, crafts movement, and uh, Willoughby may have been connected to uh, Ethel Ford because he was on the board of the Detroit Society of Arts and Crafts, uh, and uh, so were a number of uh, staff people from J.L. Hudson, who of course was related to uh, Eleanor, and, and uh, that, so that may have been an intermediary there that was a connecting reference. So Candler designed a two-story addition for the south side of the house, and uh, enlarged the garden and, and then built a garage for the chauffeur. The interior alterations were largely limited to the uh, dining room and living room. And you know, look at some of these things. A Japanese motif was introduced in the carvings of the overmantel and the pilasters. Lighting fixtures and hand irons, built-in bookcases, radiator seats were also designed by Loki. He designed everything in this portion of the house that was renovated. So it's very modern, very well uh, modern from that period, and uh, very much, Brunk says, was ahead of its time and in many respects a prelude to the later work of the ceremonies at Cranbrook. Uh, by the way, uh, as his closest friend, uh, Ernest Kanzler, just lived a few doors away. And that was part of a kind of lifelong situation where they tended to locate near each other, including in Maine. For their second home, the Fords purchased 7930 East Jefferson, which was built in 1914 uh, in the Indian Village District. This house was designed by George D. Mason, which is interesting because this is the man who gave a 15-year-old Albert Kahn uh, his start as an architectural apprentice. So this was not, Essel was not the client for the original building. More formal design, reflecting uh, the Ford family, uh, need for more room for the young children. Willoughby did do some work on this house too, uh, making changes to the front door. Their property extended down the Detroit River, and uh, Essel also built a substantial boat house to accom accommodate his growing interest in boating. Essel became an active member of the uh, Jefferson Avenue Improvement Association. So this is a picture of the house that was published contemporaneously. It was originally built, a floor plan there. Very different spirit, design, style, if you will, than the Iroquois house. So Essel became an, uh, a member, an uh, active supporter of the Jefferson Avenue Improvement Association. And while living there, he became increasingly concerned about um, the new construction, which was, he felt, approaching on his house and kind of changing the character of the neighborhood. And they tried to stop it, but unable to forestall the redevelopment uh, of a, a total apartment house, Esso decided it was time to, to move to a larger, more private site he had per that had been purchased years earlier by his father, Henry, at Gokler Point on Lake St. Clair. So, we'll get to that in a second. But while living at Jefferson, the Ford's vacation Oh, this is the house, so I'll tell you that he uh, ended up selling the house eventually. Uh, not, not initially, it was originally uh, rented, as was Iroquois, which is another interesting thing. After moving out of the two houses that he had uh, bought, he rented them for quite an extended period of time. It's really interesting that he can just sell them. But uh, the house on Jefferson ended up being purchased by the UAW. And uh, what they had in this particular location was their medical facilities for, for their work for benefits kinds of things. So that's, that's the way the house, that's the way that uh, Essel House was used after his departure. And of course, this is what was eventually put there. So there's some irony in the fact that UAW is now building on the site of the Essel's house. And by the way, that, that's not, not, not the only time that's happened. And there's other locations too. Okay, while well, living on Jefferson Avenue, the Fords uh, vacationed at Mount Desert Island, Maine, near Seal Harbor. And this location was already familiar to Eleanor, uh, who made summer trips to the beautiful resort area with her wealthy uh, uncle, 
uh, by Joseph L. Hudson, who had taken her in after her death when she was 12 years old. So the Fords decided to, to, to build a home there and purchase a site on a hilltop, 310 feet above sea level, which offered really spectacular views. It was adjacent to the hill site owned by Abby and John Rockefeller. And here's Ethel with the two kids at the time. So that's the Rockefeller house. Uh, the Rockefeller had retained Duncan Candler, again, through the services of his real estate broker, George Stebbins. And so the pattern was repeated that George Stebbins recommended uh, Candler to Ethel. The four decided to build not on the hilltop. Well, anyway, Candler also did a major expansion of the Ford, of the uh, Rockefeller project. It started out as a 50 room cottage. They called these things cottages. <laughs> 50 rooms. But, but by the time Duncan was done, it's a 100 room cottage. But they used that term. It's a term of, you know, to show they're very unpretentious, I guess. So Ford uh, decided to build not on the top of the hill, but rather two thirds of the way up. That's, that, that's Rockefeller's. Rockefeller's not quite at the top, but pretty close to the top. And the, the intention, and that's Duncan Campbell, the architect who did the main houses, and actually did a house here in um, Detroit area too, eventually. So uh, the intention to, to, to build not all the way at the top was to not make a prepossessing place, not a mansion that should stand out for its size, belittling its neighbors and grandeur. The purpose was to blend the house into the hill and make, make it as much a part of each other as possible, to combine a man-made affair with nature. The, hill, the hilltop they selected and built, as you can see here, was almost solid stone. And beneath whatever soil there was, uh, it was very difficult to excavate for a foundation. So they ended up blasting away. This is basically the whole, the whole site, solid rock. They blasted away all of the stone and um, used it. They set up a quarry right on the spot and used the stone that they were blasting out of the location for the material for their house. Mike mentioned I uh, had the pleasure of visiting the house now now on my Martha Stewart. And if you go to the basement, uh, she very artfully uh, took care of the remnants of the stone that was still down there in her wine room. It's a work of art. It's quite beautiful, but that is the actual material underneath the building. And here's another part of the wine room. So it's this exposed, exposed stone granite uh, wall, which is dramatically uh, lit. So, and that's that's the location. These I took on a kind of a grainy, dreary day, and you get you get the setting with all the rock outcrops. So the newspaper said that no. Definite, definitive architectural type has been sought in designing the house. At first glance, one would say offhand that it stands closely to follow the English precedent. But um, glancing closer, one finds it is not English, nor does it fall within any one set of classification. Um, it, it's essentially a cottage of their own style. So, and you can see there's not much ornamentation. These were these were the, uh, the granite blocks that were built not with any mortar, dry set, and, and still solid and standing. These were obviously substantial rocks. And here's some views of the house as I'm circling around, showing how it's fitting in to the site. That's a wall. Uh, I'm sorry, that's a, that's a uh, stone. That's the actual natural stone. That is not a built part of the house. That is what you see on the, the site. You can see how closely it matches what's in there in the house, in the construction of the house. So I mentioned that Eleanor said she needs to have rising sun and setting sun. So she managed to do that by, uh, Duncan Cameron accommodated that by having rooms, like a dining room, that was not connected with other rooms, but would have exposure on two sides. <clears throat> so in that beautiful room, you could actually see the rising and setting sun. <clears throat> so it uh, worked very well. 
Now, before the dining room, below the dining room, there's a garden terrace designed by Jen Jensen. Yeah. <laughs>